Look at how cool this is. Here's Harrison Ford and Edward James Almos in their flying cop car. At first glance, it's like they're staring straight ahead because each is simply too much of a badass to even acknowledge the presence of the other. Look again, though, at the spot on the bulkhead between their seats. I know in my heart of hearts that what they really don't want to look at is this. The General Electric Recon 1, hereafter to be referred to as the walkie-talkie that I owned when I was 11 years old. <laughs> Ruins the movie for me every single time. <laughs> Looking back on it, though, I also know that this scene is one of the moments that turned me into a media scholar because it taught me something important about where the future comes from. Philosopher Slavoj Žižek argues that innovation is actually the result of a particular kind of repetition. The new emerges at moments when something, even something as banal as my GE Recon 1, overcomes its historical context and reappears not as it actually was, but as it might have been. If you want to build the future, you have to ransack the past for what didn't happen, but could have. If you want to build the future, you have to steal from the doubts, fantasies, wishes, and failures of the past. In short, you have to imagine. What I'm going to talk about today is a particular kind of historical project, the study of imaginary media, the study of what might have been. Might have been. In grammar, that's called the subjunctive mood. As Samuel R. Delaney pointed out many years ago, writing in the subjunctive mood is one of the hallmarks of science fiction. So it shouldn't surprise us that science fiction is crammed full of imaginary media. Here's another example. Spock's science station on the bridge of the Starship Enterprise. What is it, really? It's a black, glossy box with a glowing blue window on top. What does it do? My friend Christian Book calls it the narrative device because the science station is a machine with one purpose. It helps advance the plot. <laughs> How do you break the Tholian web? How do you neuter a triple? Well, you look in the narrative device and bingo, there's your answer. <laughs> the point of studying this sort of imaginary media, the kind that you find on the bridges of cinematic starships and in flying police cars, is that it tells us a lot about how we envision technology working at a particular time and place, which is almost as important as understanding how it actually does work. Almost is an important qualifier because there are all kinds of imaginary media outside of science fiction. And I believe <clears throat> that if we're really interested in media innovation, we should be thinking about them too. German media scholar Siegfried Zielinski neatly divides imaginary media into three groups. Untimely media, which are realized in techn technical and media practice either long before or long after their invention. Conceptual media, which were sketched, modeled, or drafted, but not actually built. And impossible media, which cannot actually be built, but nevertheless expresses ideas which somehow impact the factual world. I'm going to talk about each of these in turn, and yes, I have cool slides for all of them. <laughs> Untimely media. Charles Babbage's difference engine number two, a sophisticated mechanical calculator, is one of the canonical examples of untimely media. So sophisticated, it contains 8,000 parts and weighs five tons, that although Babbage designed it sometime between 1847 and 1849, it wasn't actually built until the London Science Museum finished the prototype that you see here in 2002. <laughs> this is the first difference engine, number two. The prototype and the accompanying printer were never completed during Babbage's lifetime for reasons that have more to do with politics and economics than technological shortcomings. The generations of engineers, scientists, artists, and writers that imagined the difference engine in operation, though, ensured that it was, is, and will continue to be a milestone in computing history. 
Another way to think about the relevance of untimely media is in terms of the way that a good idea can return again and again. There's actually a clause in the TEDx contract that I signed that stipulates that at each conference, someone has to invoke Marshall McLuhan at some point in the conference. <laughs> so we, we drew straws backstage and, and I won. Um, so in Laws of Media, Marshall McLuhan and his son Eric point out that emergent media forms often retrieve aspects that their predecessors had temporarily obsolesced. In media history, progress is more recursive than linear. Take the pen, for example. This is the first commercial model of the telautograph, a device for sending handwritten messages over telegraph wires. As with most technologies, the telautograph had many inventors, but this is the model that Elisha Gray developed around 1887 and brought to market in 1893. Many banks and insurance companies used them at least until 1905, and there's evidence in business literature that suggests that at least some of them were still in use well into the 1940s. By 1933, though, Alan B. Dumont was already touting his CAF autograph, a device patented in 1940 that used radio signals rather than wires, and a cathode ray tube for a monitor rather than paper. Margaret Atwood's long pen, then, manufactured by Syngraphy Corporation since 2004, is neither an isolated flash of brilliance nor the shining culmination of decades of gradual improvements on a series of inferior devices, but the most recent addition to a family of machines that all actually worked pretty well at what they did. One advantage of thinking about the untimely return of media is that it's a good strategy for deflating the all too common practice of describing technology in terms of discrete objects and narratives of progress. Instead, as a number of contemporary media theorists such as Lisa Gittleman, Jennifer Darrell Slack, and Jay McGregor Wise suggest, we might be better off thinking about media technology as a complex set of relationships within a particular culture at a particular time. In any communications medium, the thing part of the technology is only one component in a larger social network that also includes all of the rules and norms that specify how we use it. At a different time in a different place, the meaning of that thing can differ dramatically, and newer isn't always better. The complex city-spanning pneumatic tube networks of the Victorian era, for example, might look quaint beside the wonders of the internet, until, that is, you have to send something that's made out of atoms, not bits, especially when that thing might mean the difference between life and death. At Stanford Hospital, four miles of pneumatic tubes shuttled blood, medication, and tissue samples through the complex at a speed of 18 miles an hour, and they don't have to worry about spam. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to think too hard about what tissue sample spam might look like. Probably a lot like spam, come to think of it. Conceptual media. The next type of imaginary media I'm going to talk about, conceptual media, are forms that have been designed or modeled at some point, but not actually built. One important difference between untimely media and conceptual media is the sort of work they do for us. Conceptual media, which have certain similarities to thought experiments like Schrodinger's famous quantum cat, are important not because of their practicality or impracticality as actual devices, but because they tell us about how a particular culture thought about a particular problem at a particular historical moment, or didn't think, as the case might be. <laughs> this is a conceptual audio circulation system imagined by the Jesuit Athanasius Kircher in 1650. In this image, Huge spiral channels convey sound from one part of a palace to another, using sculpted busts as speakers. One of the things that we can learn from it, as Zelensky points out, is that Kircher assumed that sound traveled in straight lines, that it would be reflected when it hit a smooth surface, and that it would even be amplified by reflection, hence the spiral design for the audio channels. Though it's tempting to project our own paranoia about privacy and the omnipresent technologies of surveillance into Kircher's images, there are other things going on too. Kircher also produced images of these channels amplifying the music of musical quartets and funneling it out into the air, where people miles away might encounter it in complete ignorance of its source. Still on the subject of conceptual audio, I'm sort of heading back in the direction of 
spam and meat products again. This slide is Alexander Graham Bell's ear phonograph from 1874. It consists of a mouthpiece attached to the middle ear bones of a human cadaver, which are in turn attached to a piece of straw mounted over a smoked glass. Speaking into the mouthpiece vibrates the straw and translates sound into a visible tracing. In an amazing book called The Audible Past, Jonathan Stern describes how the ear phonograph isn't just a step on the way to the invention of the telephone, but the marker of a larger cultural shift in models of sound reproduction, away from thinking about sources of sound toward thinking about sound as a kind of effect in the world. From this point, Stern argues that it makes much more sense to think about all of the audio technologies we take for granted today, especially speakers and microphones, as the result of a particular set of practices and practical understandings concerning sound and the ear and not the cause. Conceptual media, then, aren't just prototypes, but indicators of major shifts in the history of ideas. I'm going to end where I started with science fiction, because it's the home of Zelensky's third category, impossible media. These are forms of media which can't actually be built, but still express ideas that somehow impact the factual world. This image was an illustration for a story in Modern Mechanics and Inventions magazine in June 1931 called Most Scientific Fiction Can't Come True. What it depicts is a transporter, a device that breaks down matter at one location and beams it to another. The transporter actually acts as an imaginary solution to some of the tensions that I was talking about earlier between pneumatic tubes and the internet or between the teleautograph and the cathodograph. We're fascinated with it, I think, because it simultaneously expresses the longing that's at the heart of every communicative act, the longing for real presence and immediate comprehension, and the impossibility of attaining that moment of perfect communication. But just because it can't come true doesn't mean we don't want it. Moreover, there are also real possibilities in the failure of impossible media. The telemelodium from Guy Madden's short film, The Nightmare, is a device which utilizes the power of the aurora borealis to show Canada to itself. Via the phone lines, the telemelodium broadcasts images of everyday, everyday things combined and made miraculous, turning the nation itself into a vast, impossible communications device. At the very moment you say, this machine is impossible, writes philosopher Felix Guattari, you fail to see that you are making it possible by being yourself one of its parts, the very part that you seem to be missing in order for it to be already working. In Madden's film, this seemingly altruistic project draws the ire of the Canadian government when the telemelodium's images interfere with the business of the nation by clogging the phone lines. The device is immediately shut down, but its images linger on in the memories and dreams of the people. In effect, Madden retrofits the triumphal modernist narrative of Canada as a nation sutured together by rail, telegraph, and the telephone, presenting instead a wistful, precarious allegory for Canada in the 21st century that rings psychologically true without ever being even remotely accurate. My last thought, I suppose, might as well be an image from the telemelodium. When I was a kid, I idolized Stan Lee and Jack Kirby's Reed Richards, leader of the Fantastic Four, because although he was the smartest guy on the planet, he screwed up constantly, but never stopped trying. In a world where even our imaginary media fail, direct contact with another soul is unlikely at best. Under these conditions, as John Durham Peters observes, we still have to take the risk of trying. And the only rewards we can expect, really, are small cryptic tokens of friendship. The image behind me is one of Kirby's Marvel pinups. In the upper left-hand corner, Reed has written, just between us, I don't know what this silly contraption is either. Keep smiling, Reed. As Lee and Kirby used to write, enough said. Thanks. <laughs>